Uh, my name is Shamila Zaman. I'll be your MC for the evening. Uh, I'm the manager of Koroba House. Um, I'm going to introduce Sajda Zalgankar, who is the uh, head of the uh, Muslim Association of Canada, the Hamilton chapter. We'll say a few words about Koroba House and Mac, uh, and then uh, I will come back and introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Ingram Matson. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you all. I would like to welcome you here to our um, annual, or not annual, monthly or almost, sorry, our, our um, Cordoba, Cordoba House Dialogues. I am, as Shamila had mentioned, the chapter head here for the Muslim Association of Canada Hamilton chapter. Um, the Muslim Association of Canada, or MAC, is a religious, educational, social, charitable and non-profit organization. MAC provides religious and educational services and programs designed to assist in the comprehensive development of the Muslim individual, family and community. Our mission is to establish an Islamic presence in Canada that is balanced, constructive and integrated, though distinct, within the social fabric and culture of the Canadian society. Uh, MAC currently has 11 chapters across the country, um, each directly serving the needs of those local Muslim communities. So our Cordoba House, located here, um, just across the street from McMaster University campus, is a project of the Muslim Association of Canada. Our vision for Cordoba House is to establish an information center that promotes and focuses on research, as well as providing a public space where people can come in and gain an understanding of Islam and engage in dialogue, hence the, this um, event today, our, our Cordoba Dialogue. Um, Cordoba House has a library and it runs events, uh, which is intended to engage and inform the community um, about Islam and just general things that, ha that are happening in, in Canadian society. As well, um, our mission is to foster dialogue, facilitate understanding, promote research on Islam and Muslims in Canada and the role of faith in public life. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all once again. I hope you enjoy the, the event this evening and I'd like to call back to our house manager Shamila to introduce our speaker for the evening. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I'm going to just get right to the point. I'm not going to crack any funny jokes right now because I'm really sick. So, <laughs> um, our speaker is, you know, I have her bio in front of me, but I mean, I feel like I could go on for pages after that. But uh, I'll introduce her now. Uh, Dr. Inger Matson is a professor of Islamic studies, founder of the Islamic Chaplaincy Program, and director of the McDonald Center for Islamic Studies uh, and Christian Muslim Relations at the Hartford Seminary in, uh, Seminary in Hartford, Connecticut. She earned her PhD in Islamic studies from the University of Chicago in 1999. She is the author of the story of the Quran, its history and place in Muslim societies, as well as numerous articles exploring the relationship between Islamic law and society, gender and leadership issues in contemporary Muslim communities. From 2006 to 2010, Dr. Matson served as the president of the Islamic Society of North America, also known as ISNA. She previously served two terms as vice president. She is the first woman to serve in either position. Dr. Matson was born in Canada, where she studied philosophy at the University of Waterloo. From 1987 to 1988, she lived in Pakistan, where she developed and implemented a midwife training program for Afghan refugee women. Dr. Matson is frequently consulted by media, government, and civic organizations, and has served as an expert witness. In July 2012, Dr. Matson is taking the position of the inaugural chair, chair of Islamic Studies at Huron University College at the University of Western Ontario. If everyone could put their hands together for Dr. Ingram Matson. Thank you. This is just for the recording, right? But this yes. is my main mic. Okay. All right. Well, good evening. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Maybe you got a little sleepy. I think this was supposed to begin at 7.30. Uh, but I, I can do two things. I can speak really quickly to make up the time, or we, we actually have all the time we need. We can be here as long as 9.30, but I insist that we'll formally end the program at 9. So those of you who have, you know, who, for whom uh, uh, the program was advertised going to 9 o'clock will be free to go and then Anyone who wants to hang around for a little while is free to do that. Um, we came, I uh, was invited to go and meet with a number of um, Muslim community leaders over in Cordoba House before coming here. And we had a really interesting discussion, workshop 
on the evolving role of the mosque in society. And, and uh, so I'm really happy to see the community interested in this issue. Um, some of the issues were uh, probably that were raised or the emphasis maybe was a little surprising to some of the community leaders, but I was happy to see the openness um, that was displayed by all those gathered, and I think it's a really good sign for moving forward uh, in, in the community here in the Hamilton area, God willing. So let me begin my talk here today with a little story. I want to begin with a story about a mosque and an experience I had late one summer night a number of years ago. At that time, I was living with my family in an ethnic neighborhood on the southwest side of Chicago. Most of our neighbors were Arab Americans, uh, mostly Palestinian Muslims, and we lived directly across the street from the mosque, directly. I mean, our, I looked out the window and across the street was the mosque between, uh, uh, right at the edge of the street was the playground for the mosque. So there was the playground and then the mosque and all of the parking lot. I could even see in, in the windows if I wanted to. Uh, the mosque, founded about 30 years earlier, mostly by Palestinians, had been built on land that others did not want or care about. It was part of a spread of vacant land hem hemmed in by two highways and the railroad tracks. Over the years, Muslim families had bought the land around the mosque and built homes. And then they established two schools that stood adjacent to and facing the mosque across a large parking lot that functioned when it was not filled with cars during Friday congregational prayer as a kind of public square. The apartment we rented was in the first house built in the neighborhood by a woman with small children after her husband passed away. Even though her former home was in a more upscale neighborhood, she felt that her fatherless children needed to live in the mosque neighborhood to learn experientially and naturally how to be good Muslims. So that night I awoke a little past midnight to an unexpected sound, a repetitive squeaking. I knew the sound well because the mosque playground as I said, just faced my room, and the swings squeaked loudly. I checked my clock again as I heard the laughing of children. It was almost 1 a.m. I looked out the window and saw a man pushing two laughing children on the swings. Well, in the parking lot, there was only one car, a taxi, driving very slowly around the lot, parking in spaces, then backing out and parking again. <coughs> The taxi was driven by a woman, a woman wearing a headscarf. For a while, I truly thought I was dreaming. It seemed surreal. But once I woke up a little more, I realized that this man had probably just returned home from a long day at work, driving his taxi. It was summer, so the kids weren't in school yet. And all the kids in the neighborhood, in any case, kept a Mediterranean schedule during the holidays. So the family had driven to the mosque where the father could play safely with the children in the middle of the night while his wife was learning to drive in the safety of the parking lot. Now, in Arabic, the word for mosque, masjid, is in the form of a noun that signifies place or time. So the mosque is a place where prostration, prostration sajda, is formed, the place of prostration is the masjid. Sajda being the key posture of ritual prayer. But the mosque is much more than that. In America and Canada, where Muslims are a small minority of the population, it is a refuge, it is a safe space for children, it is a Muslim public square tucked inside the broader American society. It is a replacement for extended family that has been left behind in distant lands. It is a place where a Muslim does not have to explain why he dresses this way or why she doesn't want a drink. In a world where virtual communities are increasingly important, we cannot forget the importance and significance of a place, a real place, that provides these opportunities. Now when I think about this incident and about this mosque in particular, the word that comes to mind when I think of this family and what they were doing that night was 
that they were comfortable. They felt comfortable in this place to be who they were, living according to the time, the timing that they wanted to during their summer vacation, doing what they like. And they came there because it was like a home to them. Now, a home can be an escape, but I don't think most of us think of our homes as escapes. We just think of it as the place where we go for, to relax and to be ourselves and to be comfortable. And so I think we could look at the mosque, certainly for this family, as a kind of community home or religious or spiritual home, even though there was nothing that they were doing that was in any way one of the main functions of the mosque. They weren't praying, they weren't sitting reading the Quran, they weren't listening to a religious lesson, but here they felt at home. So comfort, is that a goal of the mosque? Should it be a goal of, of the community to make the mosque a comfortable place? Is there any time we would want to make it uncomfortable? or at least spiritually challenging. What do Muslims themselves want from a mosque? And how do we distinguish what they want from what they have a right to have in the mosque? And who's to make that decision? These are really the questions that arise. And what we will see is that there simply is not one answer. The demographics of the you know, I'm so used to saying American Muslim. Um, you know, when we're Americans, we're so American-centric. You know, Canada, we don't even, even though I'm a Canadian, I'm not even used to mentioning Canada. So I said the American mosque, the North American mosque, let's say. Um, you know, our, our, our demographics are so um, diverse that we are not going to have one kind of mosque, one kind of community. And what's interesting, you know, I do have um, information, the most recent information, demographic information on Americans, specifically Muslim mosques. There's a study that's done every 10 years by my colleagues at Hartford Seminary at our Institute for Religion Research called a FACT. It's an acronym that means Faith Communities Today. And this is a major study of American religious congregations. Um, all, pretty much all of the major religious denominations in uh, the United States come together to create a kind of 10-year um, uh, state of the congregation study. And so they pool their resources to make this survey and then each individual community puts in questions in the survey that are specific to them. It's kind of like a census of uh, uh, denominations. So the American Muslim community, the researchers who do this, and the primary researcher is uh, Dr. Ehsan Bagby, who's at the University uh, of um, Kentucky in Louisville. Um, he puts together extra questions in this survey that pertain particularly to the American Muslim community. And what's very interesting is that the, uh, the first results of that study were released just a few weeks ago and more results are going to be released in the next uh, few months. I'll be writing a, a brief on um, information that uh, pertains to women and gender in the community specifically. But one of the things we saw is that um, the majority of mosques in the United States that exist now were built in the last 30 years. 60% were built in the last 30 years. That's quite amazing, you know, quite astonishing when we think that, of course, there was a great wave of immigration of Muslims to the United States in the 1960s and 70s. Before that, uh, there was an um, increasing presence of African American Muslims who were making the shift from the nation of Islam to mainstream Islam. But really, it's very, still very much a young community. But as we think, you know, for those of us who grew up here or were born here, in Canada or the United States, we tend to think of the evolution of the community in ever sort of developing terms. But one of the things that we forget is that our community is constantly being changed by 
um, new, uh, new waves of immigrants. And so while the second or third generation of Muslims or uh, those who, uh, were, who converted to Islam and so are um, culturally American or Canadian and then, and then become Muslim, well, we are growing and learning, um, intermarrying, uh, learning to how to balance our Islamic, distinctive Islamic religious practices in broader society, you know, trial and error and making successes and ever going to a greater level of comfort, that that's not the whole community. Because continually, every year, new waves of immigrants come in. And of course, the new waves of immigrants are not necessarily, at, they aren't at the same point as the immigrants who came in the 60s. In the 1960s and 70s, most of the immigrants were very educated. They were professionals or they were coming for graduate studies. Many of the immigrants who have come in the last 15 years have been war refugees who have come from places like uh, Somalia, Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, um, Afghanistan, and other places. Uh, some of them are, are educated and, and are professionals, but many of them aren't. And so they come in with their own uh, very you know, specific needs. Uh, in the Bosnian community, for example, many people in that community who came uh, to the United States in various places, and where I live in Connecticut, there's a large Bosnian community, many of them came traumatized by, by war, the war crimes that they faced. Many of them had been in detention camps. Some of them had been, uh, women had been victims of rape. Um, men had witnessed a genocide. So this is a, a, a community that has um, very distinctive psychological and emotional needs in addition to their needs, economic needs to settle and spiritual needs for the community. So one of the things that those of us who are already here and who have already settled and have kind of figured things out need to do is to have a great deal of patience and understanding and empathy um, and not expect that all of the Muslims who come to this country will immediately just, you know, accept our agenda, the agenda that we've, we've set. Because they do have their own needs. Um, and, and one of their needs may be to have their mosque be also a kind of cultural association. This was the case with the Bosnians when they came. Many of them had not, um, had not really experienced a robust religious life. You know, we could call them secular, but I don't think that's a name they would put on themselves. But they did have a strong sense of Bosnian identity. And that identity was precisely what the Serbian uh, genocide, you know, it's not all Serbians, I don't want to call it Serbian genocide, but the genocide um, that was committed against the Bosnians was to wipe out that cultural identity. So the last thing that Muslims need to do is say, oh, it doesn't matter if you're Bosnian, we're all Muslim they needed to remember what it meant to be Bosnian. You know, because they are both, both Bosnian and Muslim. And they needed to, it was a, a very deep, important psychological and cultural need to teach the Bosnian language to their children. Reading and writing and convey the songs and the stories of their community because this was a people who had faced um, extinction for that very identity. And so it was so important for the rest of the community to understand that and not say, well, we're all in America now, we should all just be Muslim, cultural differences, you know, they don't, they don't make any difference. It was important to them. And one of the things that, that you know, part of being a diverse community means that, um, that we really listen to the priorities that people set for themselves. It's also the case in the United States, for example, that we see that although most of the African American community moved from the Nation of Islam to you know, mainstream um, Sunni Islam, uh, there still is a very strong sense that there need to be mosques that are oriented towards the needs of the African American community. Now, that's not to be sectarian, it's not to be exclusive. Other people are welcome, certainly there. But this is a community that has been um, historically oppressed. 
that until now faces great structural injustice in the United States. Uh, when we see the large rates of incarceration, racial, racial profiling, all sorts of things. So this is a community that needs to, um, to take seriously um, how they are viewed and placed within the broader American society and as Muslims gather strength um, together to face that reality and to deal with all of the issues that, that, that arise from that situation. So when we look at the function of the, uh, of the mosque and society, we're going to see that it is never just one thing. Um, it, Dr. Ihsan Bagby uh, did another study, an interesting study on mosques in the Detroit area. And one of the things that, that he showed very clearly was that for more educated and affluent Muslim communities, what they wanted the mosque to be was uh, a place where they could have community functions, social functions, education, adult education classes, do outreach, civic outreach, interfaith engagement. So they had, they really saw their mosque as a place of community engagement, learning, education. Whereas those Muslims who came from um, a, a lower social economic level, who were less educated, wanted really one thing from the mosque. They wanted a place to pray. They wanted a place where they could go that would be open five times a day and where they could go to pray. Now, why is there this difference? Well, let's think about the kind of people who just want the mosque as a place to pray. Probably they're working, what, 12, 14, 16 hours a day? Uh, I know, for example, when I lived in Chicago, how many mosques there were that were specifically for taxi drivers, who are, when they're not, you know, sleeping, they're working. And um, so it's not that these people don't care about the social function. It's not that they don't care about outreach. It's not care that they don't care about these things. But the reality of their life is that they are working almost all the time. And one of the things that they really appreciate, imagine in, these are people who can't afford the kind of spacious home where everyone has lots of room and, you know, someone goes off into their own office or shuts the door away from everyone. Busy, small, probably pretty, a lot of people in their home. And then all day they're in a taxi. And I don't know what you've seen, but I've seen that some of the clients of taxi drivers are very polite and friendly, and many others are pretty rude and ignorant and cheap and don't tip. And uh, at night, they're probably, you know, drunk, and some of them are throwing up in the back seat of the car, and even worse than that. So you imagine, you know, their life to have a place where they can go and open the door. It's a clean, quiet place where they can just go in peace and pray and remember their human dignity, connect with God um, in this spiritual moment is something so precious for them. And it's important that we recognize the value of that as we try to look at, you know, give an overview of our whole community and see where the needs are. This, you know, this, the function of the mosque as a place of congregational prayer is, is primary. I mean, that is the main function of a mosque. And the question is, how do we if we start with that function, let's focus on that first. Prayer is the not only the major pillar of Islam, but it is the thing that most scholars traditionally said really separates a Muslim from a non-Muslim. Someone who you can you can deny or question or you know have a different view on many things, but someone who says, I don't have to pray five times a day. Is, is not a Muslim, according to uh, most scholars. Now, you may abandon prayer because you're lazy or sinful. That's, that's not the same as saying, I don't have to pray. So prayer is so important. 
And to have that place is an absolute priority. But that's a place for the whole community. One of the things when I met with the community leaders uh, at Cordoba House before we came, I mentioned to them this verse of the Quran that says, the believing men and the believing women are partners of one another. They enjoin the good and they forbid evil and they establish prayer. So here we have the Muslim men or the believing men and the believing women who are partners and the word that the Quran uses is awliya. This is, this is the strongest relationship you can get, relationship of dependence and care and concern for each other. And it's quite striking that in talking about the, the creation of a community, of an ethical community, which is what it means to enjoin the good and forbid evil, a community that cares, that lives ethically and tries to establish itself as a moral community, and by that I don't mean some sort of you know, uh, you know, popular issues about, you know, just whatever is the moral issue of the day. I mean, real ethics that lives ethically. The next thing they do, the most important thing that they do as an activity is to establish prayer. And establishing prayer means to establish a pr place for prayer. So this is a job of men and women. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, do not forbid the maidservants of God from the mosques of God. And his practice was for men and women to be in the mosque together. There was no divider between men and women in his mosque. When he came in, he would greet the women, he would talk to them, he would go back and listen to their concerns. So this was his practice, his sunnah, as we say, his normative practice that we should imitate. Unfortunately, uh, the reality is that in many, many mosques, women do not feel comfortable. And that's something that was confirmed to me just by the discussion we had before I came here today. Uh, almost everyone agreed that the mosques still are not a very comfortable place for women. And this is really unfortunate. Um, and it will hold us back. Because if we can't get the, the basic function of the Muslim community right, then I don't think we're going to have much success with anything else. Um, so this is something that we really need to focus on. One of the things that this new fact study shows, um, it's quite interesting. It shows that until now, most communities still have some physical divider between men and women. And most of us had thought that that had changed, but as I said at the beginning, if you'll remember, we have had the majority of Muslims in the United States right now are still our first generation because we have had so many immigrants. So what happens is they bring their models from the Muslim world that are influenced by their culture with them, and that has really affected our growth. But what's interesting is in the mosques, that are the most diverse, most culturally diverse, and there were ways in the survey to determine that. In the mosques that are the most culturally diverse, there is not a divider, between the, a physical divider between the men and the women. And what does that say to me? One of the things, probably one of the most common themes of contemporary Muslim discourse is, what is the relationship between religion and culture? Uh, we talk about it all the time. And of course, everyone has a culture. We aren't going to get rid of culture, but there's positive culture and there's negative culture. I mean, culture is very important. In fact, it's one of the, one of the maxims of Islamic law is that good culture is um, effective, is in fact enforced as a uh, source of law. But there's bad culture too. How do we determine that? You know, mostly we don't think about it until it's challenged. And one of the most natural ways that that's challenged is when people from different cultures come in the same space. And suddenly you find, you know, the Pakistani Muslims in the same mosque with the Egyptian Muslims and the same mosque with the African American Muslims. And some people say, oh, we have to do this. And the other said, no, no, you don't have to do that. Um, or you don't have to do it this way. And the other one says, what are you talking about? 
That's completely ridiculous. Why would anyone want to do it that way? And then this conversation begins, well, wait a minute, how do we separate these things? How do we separate religion from culture? And so the very diversity of the, of the community creates an opportunity for dialogue and creates an opportunity to start to think about the difference between religion and culture. And when, when that method of um, examining our practice begins, then it can be very helpful with all sorts of things. First, we have to get used to it. Most people are not raised that way. You're raised to do what you know, your parents or the imam or the older people in the community told you is the right thing to do. You know, this is how we do things and so you do it. Very often it's not even said, you simply imitate the practice of the person beside you. That's how most religious practices and norms and really any sort of norms um, or, or, or habits are developed is by imitating people who are around you and it's unconscious. But suddenly the difference or the clash of practices brings us to consciousness and now people have to start talking. And some people call overseas and some people go to the internet and some people pull out a book and some people say Sheikh so-and-so said this and Sheikh so-and-so said that. And all of these different forms of authority are brought in and at some point you know the community has to decide how are we going to make decisions? Given the diversity of opinions, and in fact the diversity of schools there are in Islamic thought, legitimate differences, legal schools, theological schools, how are we going to make decisions? And so at this point, the governance process becomes paramount. And when the community realizes that, that nothing is going to go smoothly unless they have a clear governance process, then you'll find that there's, there's constantly problems and conflict that never seem to get resolved because what happens is they only get pushed aside for a while. Whoever has the strongest voice or the strongest opinion or the most fluent Arabic and can, you know, hit you over the head with, a, with some kind of hadith or, you know, they're going to get their way. Um, and, and, and people will feel resentment and they'll feel frustrated, they'll feel, well, this isn't really right, but I don't have the, you know, I don't have the knowledge to respond. And so it's really at that point that governance becomes more important. And it's at that point that the community realizes, you know what, this is our responsibility, our collective responsibility. We cannot avoid it. You cannot simply call a scholar overseas and that ends the problem because why would you choose that? What gives that scholar authority over someone else? That won't work. It is our responsibility. I remember uh, I've gone to communities before, especially when I was president of ISNA, and sometimes people would come to me and they said, oh, we're having such a problem with our imam. You know, he doesn't understand our issues and he doesn't you know, he's not very friendly with the women and he doesn't speak to the youth. And I'm looking at this person, this someone on the board of the mosque. And I say, well, you know, I think you should write to the Vatican and tell them that this imam is not working out for you. I said, I said he's your imam, you chose him. You know, what are you complaining to me about? So why do we get in that position where we end up binding ourselves or putting an authority someone over us and then they're not the right person. So the people are as important as the space. I don't want to say necessarily more important, but if you have bad people, you certainly can drive people away. And one of the principles, the major ethical principles or foundational principles of Islamic ethics is it's better to avoid a harm than to do a good. So I would rather you bring no imam than to bring an imam who's going to drive people away from the mosque. Right? You know, just have a well-organized and educated laity until you can bring someone who has that expertise rather than have someone who's going to drive people away and we all know about those situations. You know, you can even rent a space for a while and put your money into having a good person 
and that person is going to attract others. And then you'll have the people who can do fundraising and make the place. But who wants an empty building? There's a lot of empty buildings in society. You know, people, whether it's in the for-profit or not-for-profit sector, if they begin with a building, very often they find out that that building remains empty. So, what do we need? What do we need from the leadership? Well, that's what you have to decide and it's going to differ from different communities. How many, how many people here are on a board of a mosque or Islamic center? Can you raise your hand if you are? If you have been or are? It's a few. Okay. Now, how many of you people who are on a board of a mosque or Islamic center wrote a, a professional job description when you hired your imam? Can you raise your hand? One, two. Are you in the same, or same mosque or different one? Okay. So it seems like such a basic thing, but we, we have this, um, in most cases, when I have had requests to make referrals for imams of mosques, and I've asked the, you know, it's, it's inevitably the president of a board of a mosque who asked me, I say, okay, can you send me the job description? And most of the time they don't have one. Now, if they have one, very often it's five points. Uh, must have memorized the Quran, must be fluent in Arabic, fluent in English and can relate to the youth. I'm like, okay, well at least they thought of some of the needs that they have in the community. But is this realistic? Is this realistic in one person that you can have all of these things? Um, and then I asked them, what are the benefits? What salary are you willing to give them? What benefits are you giving them? And uh, what kind of what is the governance structure? What is their authority related to the board? Can I see that? Very seldom do we find that. You know, I, um, I founded at Hartford Seminary a program for Muslim chaplains. It's the first program for Muslim chaplains that's uh, accredited by the Association of Theological Seminaries. I have, now that program's been going about a dozen years, and I have fantastic brilliant young Muslims, both men and women, who are choosing this chaplaincy as their first career. My students have been placed at Yale, Princeton, Duke, and many other prestigious Ivy League universities. They're going working in correctional institutes, in hospitals, and in the military. I have not had one of my students, not one, who has been willing to give up chaplaincy to be the imam of a mosque. And each one of them has been asked, and uh, what is their reason? They say because the communities don't respect the imams. It's very interesting because when you ask the communities, they say, oh, our imam doesn't understand us. Our imam just knows the Quran and isn't educated. So we have this, this split. What's happening? So I think at this point, our mosques will not succeed unless we take seriously, one, governance, two, the functions that we want performed within the mosque, and then three, take a professional approach to human resources. One, an, a, a realistic job description. You cannot have someone, you know, maybe there's someone like, um, may God preserve him, Imam Suhaib Webb, who has just been appointed as the Imam of the uh, uh, Boston, uh, the Islamic Society of Boston, the Cambridge Mosque there. Fantastic. Muslim American convert. He used to be a hip hop DJ. He knows everything about American culture. He went to Mecca, memorized the Quran. He went to Al Azhar. He, he got his, his uh, Alam degree. I mean, he's got everything. Came back, same person, beautiful person. He's been in the mosque for two and a half months. I saw him last week. He said, you know, the first week I had people coming to me and saying, I've got, you know, this problem with uh, my marriage. Other people coming in saying I was sexually abused. Other people coming saying I have addictions. And he just said, whoa, 
I wasn't trained for any of this. I wasn't trained for any of this. So he talked to the people of the community and they said, okay, you know, so-and-so is a social worker and she can help you with referrals for this problem. So-and-so is someone who's involved in the you know, local issue, youth issues who can help you with this. And he said, I'm an imam, I've been trained for certain things, but I cannot do everything. And identifying that was very important because, again, first do no harm, right? Which is basically the epitome of the uh, ethical principle I mentioned. It's better to avoid a harm than to do a good. If you don't know, then don't, don't advise people or counsel them. So to know that and then to get together a group, to get together a committee that is going to be able to identify the needs. And if you can't have the needs served in-house, then you, you need to be able to make referrals. And, you know, that's a lot of what my chaplain students do, even though they're trained in counseling. Many of the issues are too, um, you know, they're too extensive for them to deal with to follow up, but they know how to identify the issues, the human needs, and make referrals. So very often what we, you know, one of the things Muslims say is that, um, you know, the mosque should be the center of the community. And sometimes that is, there's, there's a misunderstanding in that, thinking that everything should be done in the mosque. And that's not, that's not the case. It's not always good for everything to be done in the mosque. With things like, you know, domestic violence, um, you can't have housing for domestic violence in the mosque. It needs to be an anonymous place. You know, and there's many other functions that should not be there where people are coming in and out in the community. But you need to be able to say, this is, these people are part of our community, they're welcome in the mosque, and we need to be able to find a mechanism for identifying the needs and making referrals, working with the local agencies. Canada, there is such a proliferation of social services. There doesn't need to be a Muslim in front of it for it to be work. You're Canadian, you know, like everyone else. So you work with those agencies to make those referrals, but it's very important. So this focus on the human needs is essential. Now, who are the people who are making the decisions? The community is the one that has the right. And until the board or the governance structure of the mosque reflects the diversity of the community, the board will not serve the community. So what do I mean by reflecting the diversity of the community? the ethnic diversity, the age diversity, the gender diversity. You cannot have a board of seven men and one woman. You know, we were talking in our, in our discussion earlier about tokenism. This is not going to work. Um, is there, you know, proportionally, how many men are there to women in the community? It's probably about 50-50, right? That's in most societies, that's how it works, unless uh, something strange has been going on here lately. But I think it's probably 50-50. Do you have even close to that? What about age representation? I mean, look at your board. Does everyone kind of look the same? Is their hair graying all at the same rate? You know? Um, how long have you known each other? So how do you find those people? You know, one of the things that I hear is, well, we, we told them that you know, they can join, but they didn't come. Or, where are they? We asked them to step up. Let me give you a few, uh, a few things that happen. One, uh, I, my first experience on the board of an Islamic organization was when I was, my children were in a local Islamic school. And that school was founded by three very generous, God-fearing, you know, wonderful brothers who put a lot of their own money and time into founding this school. May God bless them and reward them. That's the founder stage of an organization. And it got to the point where, you know, they'd been doing it by themselves now for 10, 15 years. And the parents in the school, they weren't satisfied with all of the decisions that were being made in the school. They had no outlet for giving feedback. And it reached a point of quite a lot of tension in the school. And so finally, the board, the board was so reluctant to give up any of the decision-making power. Why? Because they just, they knew each other and they really trusted each other. They were so afraid of what would happen. But because of pressure of the parents, they finally capitulated and they said, okay, we'll let 
two parents on the board, one you know, representative of the fathers, one a representative of the mothers. So that was fine. So I'm sitting in a meeting. I'm, I was doing my, my doctoral studies at this time. So I'm sitting in a meeting with the women, and we're saying, OK, so who's going to do it? So we, we select one woman. Oh, no, no, I, I can't do that. No, my husband, you know, he won't like that. He won't like it if I go to those, those meetings. Then another one. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I, I'm standing there and said, what are you doing? We fought for this right to be on the board, and now no one's going to do it. So I was so frustrated, and I knew my husband, God bless him, who always is sitting here, uh, who always forced me. I said, fine, I'll do it. I'll do it for a little while, and then one of you has to take over, because I'm too busy. I'm studying. and So they said, yeah, yeah, you do it, you do it. All right. So, okay. So I go to my first board meeting a few weeks later. And I'm like, OK, where's the board meeting? They said, oh, at so-and-so's house. I said, what, the board meeting's at his house? They said, yeah, 7 o'clock at night. I'm like, OK. So I go to his house. This is, this is a very generous, wonderful man, lives in a beautiful home. I go in the home. Where's the meeting? Oh, it's downstairs. It's in the man cave. The meeting's in the man cave. So I'm, I go downstairs. There's seven men sitting around the table. I said, all right. Because this way, guess what? His wife's in the kitchen. She brings down tea. She brings down sweets. Or having... So I told him, I said, look, this isn't going to work. I, I, you know, I don't want to come to meetings here. We have to have the meetings at the school. Oh, they grumbled. They really felt very comfortable in his home. But I said, I don't. And no, you know, if I, even if I'm comfortable, you, why do you think no women want to want to take this position? This is very awkward. So we had to change the meeting, you know, to a professional in one of the rooms in the school at a reasonable time and finish it at a reasonable time and get out. And fortunately, after that, it was you know a good experience. And uh, and after that, then women didn't only have to be the mothers' club representative; they could be on the board in any position. And, and women after that served in that position. But that shows you know, one of the things that, that you know, are you really making it friendly to just say, oh, yes, you know, anyone can come, is not, doesn't work. You have to really look at the structure, at the space. Are you, in fact, making it welcome? Um, and then the other thing is, sometimes you have to Develop the leaders. You have to do some role playing. You have to do some orientation. One of the things when I became ISNA president that I implemented is that whenever we have a new election and we have, because we have a rotating board, every two years we have some new members of our majlis. Every time we have uh, 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 new members coming onto the board, we have a formal orientation. And that an orientation includes not only a discussion of our fiduciary responsibilities as board members, but also some of the dynamics. You know? And one of the things I, I had to discuss with some of the, we have uh, on our board for the Islamic Society of North America, the president of the MSA and the president of MINA, which is the Muslim Youth of North America, which is between 12 and 18 years old, they sit on our board as equal voting members with the rest of the board. One of the things I, had, I, I often have to counsel them is, look, when you're in the meeting, you can't call anyone uncle. They're not your uncle here. You can call them uncle somewhere else, but not here. Here, you're an equal. You're an equal voting member. And we have this, you know, Muslim society places a great deal of respect on, on older people. Um, it is, uh, you know, it's an important value. I really think it is that we should have respect for older people. Um, but we should also respect all of us. And in a board, we have to respect uh, all of those who have a voice. And it is one of the sunnahs of the Prophet Muhammad. He, there's a beautiful story of when the Prophet was sitting in a majlis in a meeting with many people, the old men of the tribe, right? What does Sheikh mean? Sheikh means old man. Literally in Arabic, it means an old man. So the Prophet Muhammad is sitting with the, with the shiuch, with the sheikh of, sheikhs of the tribe in the majlis in the meeting, and his little daughter, Fatima, walks in. And what does he do? He moves over and gives her a seat. And that wasn't the only time when very publicly, 
the prophet solicited opinions of the youth. In, you know, you couldn't get a more patriarchal society than 7th century tribal Arabia. That is the epitome of, pat the patriarch means the elder of the tribe, right? And so he was demonstrating that need to take input from the young, to take input from women. There's a beautiful story that Professor uh, Mohacha Kaf, do any of you know her? She's a professor of comparative literature at University of Arkansas. She has a beautiful story in which she, which she mentions in an article she has um, about uh, Asma bint Yazid, who was a, a companion, one of the uh, Sahaba, a, a Muslim living at the time of the Prophet Muhammad. And when the Prophet one time was in his, you know, in the mosque and he's giving a lecture, uh, suddenly this, this woman, Asma, stood up. And she said, this isn't Asma bint Abi Bakr, this is Asma bint Yazid, for those of you who know the difference. She stood up and she said, she said, oh, Prophet, I want to ask you, oh, Rasulullah, I want to ask you a question. And he said, yeah, ask me. And she proceeded to ask a question. She said, I speak on behalf of the women. You know, most of the time we're so busy with our husbands and our homes and our children, we don't have all of the opportunities to do all of these great, you know, glorious public things that men do. So will we get our reward? And, and the Prophet Muhammad answered her, he gave her a beautiful answer about the reward that they would get for everything they do and nothing would be lost. But the important thing is before he said that, before he responded to her, he did something else. And just imagine, okay, just imagine even if you were in your regular mosque and there's a visiting scholar, very respected scholar, think of someone who you think is, you know, the most respected scholar, standing there giving a talk, the men are sitting and the women are sitting and a woman stands up and interrupts in the middle. She says, oh, Sheikh, excuse me, I have a question. Now just imagine what everyone's thinking, right? This is what, I like that, but this is what's the messenger of God, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So what does the Prophet do before he answers your question? He turns to the men and he says, have you ever heard a more eloquent woman than this woman here? So what does he do? He affirms her right to ask that question. He affirms her eloquence. He affirms her question, her questioning of a very, you know, important theological issue. And of course, the way the Prophet asks it in the form of a question, you know, now everyone, all the men have to be sitting there, oh yes, no, we never heard, you know, someone, someone that as eloquent as that, right? They have to answer it in their heart. So it's a beautiful example of affirming that. Now, if those women had been in another room, how would she have asked the question? How would she have asked the question? This is the problem we have. How are women's questions going to be answered if they can't even raise their hand? If they can't be seen? This is a serious problem that we have and it needs to be addressed. One of the things, and I want to close up so we have some time for discussion, one of the things that we talked about in our group over there is the fact that, you know, a beautiful aspect of the musalla, which is the prayer space in a mosque, is there are no benches. There are no chairs. And every, everything is relational. We stand in relation to each other. We form the space by how we stand in relation to each other. So, yes, the, the, the uh, traditional uh, sunnah way, I would say, of praying in congregation is that the men are in front of the women so that men aren't behind women. Let me put it that way. But when the prayer is over, I mean, when I'm praying, I'm praying to God and whoever's in front of me, whether it's another woman or a man, whoever it is, it doesn't really matter. We're just praying line after line after line, right? But when the prayer is over, is there something sacred that's called men's space or women's space? No, it's just space. And this space can be divided any way that we like. 
I have been in, there are some mosques that have enough money to have a nice separate lecture hall or a meeting room and so after the prayer is over everyone goes down, men and women, youth and has a discussion, adult forum class, board meeting, something like that. But most mosques are not big enough. They don't have that space. So where is the public square? You know, where is the public space? The musalla has to be that then. And you know what? When the prayer's over, you can divide it whatever way you want. And I know it feels awkward at first, but there's nothing wrong with it. I remember when I was at the, the uh, Islamic Center in Plainfield, which is where ISNA's headquarters is. It's a beautiful modern design, very beautiful. No minarets, no domes, uh, but a very beautiful modernist design, this mosque. It's another question, you know, what are we putting our money into? Do you know how much a dome or a minaret costs? It's a lot of money. You know, if you're not going to be climbing up that minaret to make the call for prayer. But in this mosque, there's a beautiful um, open musalla. There's also a balcony with glass in front of it for those who would like to go up there and some women pray up there. But in the open musalla, we have the men and women praying. And I was there for a wedding one time. And after we prayed Zohar, then the sheikh uh, wanted to have a public witness of the marriage contract. And he, was, he, he moved back from the, um, from the mimbar. So he moved back towards the middle of the mosque. He sat on the floor and he said, okay, now I want the groom and all the men on my left side. And I want the bride and all the women on my right side. So now we just switched the space, right? Now we just turned it. And it was very interesting to see people getting used to that. It was, it's so easy for a practice to turn into a taboo. So it almost seemed like it was wrong for the men felt awkward like walking in the space where usually the rows of women were and the men felt awkward walking in the space where usually the rows of men were. But why? It's just a carpeted room, right? And so we did that, and then he uh, proceeded to, um, uh, to marry this bride and groom in front of the witness of the whole community. It was, very, it was just a beautiful occasion. But, you know, also traditionally, if you go to the Middle East, and you go to the oldest mosques, what you will find along, along the uh, aisles, usually around the center where there's a center pillar, um, you will find a very high, uh, an elevated chair called a kursi. It means chair or throne. And in fact, these were endowed chairs for lecturers in mosques. It's where the idea of an endowed chair in a university comes from. If you read the research of George Mekdesi, great research he did on the transfer of uh, and models of endowed um, institutes of higher learning in the Muslim world, how that was transferred into Europe uh, after the Crusades. Really, the Crusaders um, took that knowledge and transferred it, or the people who came with them transferred it into Europe. So the idea of an endowed chair comes from these chairs that could be in universities or they could be in what were called jamming mosques, the congregational mosques. That chair is not where the, the minbar is at the front, where the imam or where the khatib, the preacher, preaches on Friday. It's at the side so that when the prayer is not going on, anyone who wants can gather around the scholar and listen in that space and there's still space on the other side if people come in and they want to pray. So what I'm saying here is that we need to be more creative with our space and creative doesn't mean you know the the, the evil word that, that uh, Muslims know which is what? Bid'ah, right, bid'ah. Because, because Muslims have always been creative with this space. Go travel, I encourage you, urge you, go travel across the Muslim world and go look at old mosques and see how the space is split up. And you will see that they used the, they used the space well. And they had 
the form followed function. And one of the beautiful things of having, as I say, of having a space with no chairs or benches is that you can make what is the, the you know, really the hallmark of uh, Islamic learning and community is the halaqa, is the circle. Uh, Wa'al Halaq, who's a professor of uh, um, Islamic law, he used to be at McGill, now he's at Columbia, and he has a new book on Islamic law. He spends a lot of time talking about the halaqa as really the unit of learning in Islamic society. And that circle can be created anywhere. So when you have the visiting scholar come to the masjid, or the imam who wants to talk outside of prayer, move him, you know. Move him to a place so all of the community feels comfortable coming around in that circle and hearing and learning and can not only hear, these aren't monologues. Only the khutbah, only the Friday sermon is a monologue. The rest should be interactive, you know, and that form needs to be established. Um, you cannot have that interaction without having the space to do that, without constructing um, uh, an opportunity for all to be involved with that. Well, I have so much else to say, but I did promise that I would let you go by nine, so I'm going to close here and have some time for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matson, for that enlightening talk. Um, we're going to take about 20 minutes of Q&A. Uh, I actually have a volunteer here. She's going to be passing the mic around. So if you could just uh, stand up and just raise your hand, and uh, we'll, come, we'll come to you. And uh, please keep your questions uh, short and brief. Do you have a mic over there? Yeah, yeah she does. Okay. But if you, leave, if you need to leave by 9, please, I won't be offended. You know, just step out. <clears throat> Um, what advice or practical, practical advice do you have for sisters who are um, trying to challenge the status quo within um, the different mosques in terms of uh, removing the barrier or the partition that separates the sisters from the brothers? Because mm -hmm. what often happens is that the sisters who engage in this type of work get ostracized, they get blacklisted, they get um, uh, targeted for being someone that shouldn't be engaged in this type of work. So what kind of practical mm -hmm. advice can you give for the sisters in this type of work? Well, first of all, I don't think it's the responsibility only of the women. I mean, it's the responsibility of the whole community. So for the men to leave the women hanging in this situation is really unfair. Uh, do they not have daughters? Do they not have sisters? Do they not have wives? Even if they have none of this, what about the, you know, how many new Muslims do I know who have been so excited to come to the mosque only to feel shut out? They have so many questions. They want to have a par be part of community. They want to learn something. And they face literally a wall between them and the source of that knowledge and sense of community. So I, I, you know, I really think the men have to step up and understand this responsibility as well. This, should, this is not just a woman's issue, right? This is an issue for the whole community. So I would say, first of all, there needs to be that community discussion. Second, there needs to be, um, you know, then you need to, t to look at how are decisions being made? I mean, how do these things happen? Sometimes, as I say, it's simply because someone is particularly pushy or vocal. And, and clearly, most people do not go to the mosque to engage in conflict or controversy. And by nature, most people are conflict averse. This is how we're made. We don't want to get involved in, in, in conflict. Um, but the reality is, and, and I don't like it, I'm extremely conflict averse. But sometimes, you know, you see an injustice, you have to deal with it. You may not like it. It's not, you know, why you came to the mosque, but the reality is you find an injustice there. You need to deal with it. Um, and so I, I really wish that people would understand that and take that responsibility, both men and women. This is why, you know, we, it is a partnership. So we need to work together. 
then you have to, you have to look at the way things decisions are being made and I think honestly uh, issues like this need to be put in the bylaws um, or the founding deeds of these institutions these are not non-profit institutions because otherwise you can get you know the ebb and flow of suddenly a new group of people comes in and there's one person who's particularly vocal about this and can change the whole dynamic and something that is foundational I mean literally foundational to the structure of the mosque um, needs to be taken care of in the deed and you'll see this um, I mean when you look at the history of endowments charitable endowments in Islamic society and this was all of all mosques, all madrasas, all schools were uh, funded by endowments in pre-modern Muslim societies. Unfortunately, the colonialists took them over and then the nation states, they were all nationalized and put under these ministries of uh, religious endowments and religious affairs. Um, so most of them under government control in the Muslim world. We don't have that here. We have the right to do what we want. Um, but so we need to really take, pay attention to these founding documents and the founders of endowments were very particular if you look at the founding deeds for, um, for mosques you can, you can find things like I remember uh, Dr. Omar Abdullah was telling me about one endowment he was reading a mosque that was founded by a woman in which she not only um, you know designated uh, describe the space and what activities would go on but she even said uh, the imam or the preacher should not yell at people and put them down and I mean she gave very detailed instructions about the kind of religious uh, lessons and teaching and presence that she wanted in that so uh, uh, I think these issues are so important that we really need to get them at the ground at the groundwork and we shouldn't always go you know there's this is the difference between a right and a need okay women have the same right as men to go to the mosque and it's not sufficient the fact that men can say oh women aren't required to go to a Juma prayer does not at all in any way impact their right to be able to go to the mosque and to have that space and to be part of the community that has, those are completely two separate things um, and so I think once we understand these and really understand the law, Islamic law as well as our tradition I think we'll make some progress inshallah Thank you so much um, and I just want to say thanks to all the questions so I just have two really quick questions one is just a follow up to what we just pointed out and I appreciate your response and what you've mentioned, though, you know, what, what keeps coming really strongly back to me as you speak uh, of all these practical solutions that we should start implementing is that, you know, um, we here at McMaster University, and, and part of the MSA, um, and I'm a great supporter, have a female president. So, so we can come to that point, mm -hmm. we even have a female mm -hmm. president. Nevertheless, the amount of struggle and difficulty and, and hairs and, and the hops and puffs that went about just to change, just to change the basic structure of a very uh, well attended, famous kind of home of Halfa of the MSA mm -hmm. was a huge ordeal. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't one that I had to go through, it was one that mm -hmm. someone that I met to actually, someone I'm very proud of in our community, mm -hmm. had to go through. Mm -hmm. There were women who came and said, We feel marginalized. We don't speak up in these Halfa mm -hmm. groups in this circle because the speaker, who mm -hmm. is male, sits on one side and everyone else sits on the other side, and women are kind of at the back. Right. The question became, Why do they not engage? Why don't they speak up? And maybe they're all stupid, I, I beg to differ, or mm -hmm. maybe they just don't feel that they're being welcome. Right. And that even though they have the opportunity to speak up, that is not the facilitated mm -hmm. by the space. Mm -hmm. Now to change the setting it finally has changed it was a huge ordeal. So my question to you is, and this is in the prayer space just on campus for the female president. My question is what are our leaders doing, people like yourselves, to, to practically implement, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know, um, sessions, workshops, mm -hmm. what is being done to implement this mm -hmm. is a huge problem in our community. Right. And these practical steps, never that we, we are aware of them, but How's it going to happen if it's that alone? I don't think the community is going to change anytime soon. Perhaps I'm a pessimist in 24. No. Um, I think, I mean, I'll tell you, there's a, there's a lot of change. One of the things that we see, the difference between 
Okay, this fact study I mentioned was done in 2011. Ten years before the study in 2004 showed a huge difference in the attitudes of Muslims towards uh, women's participation in the board. The vast majority, over 90% of, of American Muslims, these are Americans, believe that or have, they have no obstacles to women serving on the boards of their mosques. Now, 90% have not had a woman on their board in the last five years. The number, I don't have it in front of me, but it's only about 60%. But the shift in attitude is tremendous. The shift in attitude is something like uh, a 30% increase. I mean, it's a huge increase in 10 years, which shows that the education that we're doing, the modeling that we're doing, I think are helping very much. One of the things that ISNA did over 10 years ago was to develop a document called Best Practices for Islamic Centers. There's eight different aspects to that. One of them is women's participation in the mosque. The other is governance, financial stability, interfaith engagement, youth, you know, these kind of things. We not only develop those guidelines in consultation with the community, but we go around to communities and we give workshops on it, talk about it in the convention. And then there's a separate document that was prepared by the um, Islamic Social Services Association. Those of you who know Sister Shahina Siddiqui, and um, in conjunction with Women in Islam, which is a New York City based organization run by uh, Aisha al um, They consulted a number of scholars and prepared uh, a document called um, Women Friendly Mosques, something subtitle. Um, but in any case, that was supported, you know, CARE signed on onto that, ICNA, uh, ISNA, all sorts of organizations signed on to it, so it be began to be disseminated on the internet. I think that's really affected attitudes. But, so that's a huge step. I mean, changing attitudes and perceptions is big, but then you have to move on to the things like um, making sure that, that the atmosphere is truly welcoming and friendly, possible. You know, as I said, like my example with um, not having the meetings in a, you know, in the school rather than in a man's home. Um, and then there has to be um, uh, also training. You know, one of the things, there have to be opportunities for that because it's, it's a question of getting used to treating each other with dignity and respect and equally without these kind of hang-ups um, that unfortunately, you know, some people have. And, and realizing that there are different, you know, there are priorities. I mean, I understand that, that, for example, I don't think there's anything wrong with, say, young Muslim men who aren't married, thinking that it's better if they spend more time, you know, in a kind of more all-male environment than with young women. I understand that, but the reality is they're spending all day in school with women and they're able to treat them respectfully and focus on their work. So they need to be able to model that as, as well. I mean, you're focusing on the, the lesson. Um, you know, you have to learn how, how to do that. So I think, I think here um, we have to have some respect for each other and understand the concerns, but at the same time, realize that um, you know, if someone's struggling with something, we can empathize, but it doesn't, it, that, that isn't a reason or an excuse for, for excluding or marginalizing half of the community. Well, first, first of all, there's the laws of the land, so you have to respect whatever. I'm not as familiar with the laws governing political speech in Canada. But one of the rules that I always put in place is, for me, whenever I'm in a position of authority or leadership, 
is that I do not have a right to represent the community on matters for which they did not give me that authority. So, for example, when I was ISNA president, in fact, there were many issues that I had a personal opinion on politically that I did not speak about because it would be impossible even in that situation to separate my role because I was the head of the organization from personal speech. And at that point, it wouldn't even be appropriate for me to say, well, this is just my personal opinion. And I refrained from speaking on a number of matters that I felt I was not, uh, I didn't have the authority, my authority came from the community. And they hadn't given me that authority to, you know, take, make some partisan position or even on some controversial social matters um, take a position. There were other things that were clear cut and I had the authority to speak on their behalf because I had their feedback or, you know, some other mechanism of determining that. So I think that's really important. Um, and it is good to educate the community generally about their, about issues that will affect them as Muslims. Um, you know, in their distinctive identity as Muslims, how, you know, being involved in civic society, politi political society, how you do that in order to retain your rights and be a responsible citizen. But I don't think it should be a political place. I think the most natural, the natural, the most natural outreach for a mosque is multi-faith engagement. This is a religious institution, after all. That's that's what it is, right? It's not it's not a um, it's not a secular social justice organization. So it's a place for for faith and religion and belief. And of course, our religion speaks on all these matters. But all almost all these matters um, are are subject to ijtihad, different opinions. So there's a lot of discussion about which side we should take. You know, even whether should Muslims be have, be more politically towards a political um, socialist position or libertarian? You know what? It's really not that clear. Yes, we believe in taking care of anyone, but what's the best mechanism? You know, so you can't just assume that everyone is sort of on board on a certain political philosophy or economic philosophy. That's not it's not right, and they need to be debated. But I do think that there is so much space for multi-faith engagement or interfaith engagement because there's a, we can learn from those people. They are, they are our next circle of community. After, uh, after the believer, the Qur'an talks so much about Ahlul Kitab. We are part of Ahlul Kitab, right? We have our Kitab, which is Al-Qur'an, and we are part of that community. That's our next, you know, that's our extended family. If the Muslim community is our family of faith, the Ahlul Kitab are extended family and then beyond with other communities of faith, people who, who believe in God, and then on to humanity, etc. So we should really look at that because there are, they can help engaging with people of other faith. In my experience and the experience of everyone I know can really help affirm your faith. And it can help especially young people who feel, you know, they shouldn't feel like there's Muslims and non-Muslims. Wow, what a strange dichotomy. They should feel that they're Muslim in a landscape peopled with those who have faith, right? And then they're going to feel more natural being who they are as Muslims, being able to not, I'm not saying to uh, evangelize or to make dawah or anything like that. I'm saying just not to censor yourself. Should I not be willing, should I not be able in a, in a simple conversation with someone to say something like, God willing? You know, did I not ever use the word God in my speech? You know, this kind of censoring out any kind of religious speech. You know what? If you talk to if you talk to a Jewish person, they will absolutely understand God willing and they'll they'll say it too. You know, and then you feel, hey, you know, maybe I can be a Muslim naturally in society without you know, don't use Arabic, no one's gonna understand you. You're gonna say inshallah, they're like, what did they just say? I have no idea. You can say God willing, it means the same thing and they'll understand you. You know, so I, re I think that we should first look at, at interfaith or multi-faith engagement. You know, bring people in to, to give some basic information, if necessary, if this is the, the only place where you can get it in the mosque or where you think it's going to be the only place. But I don't think it should be a place, the mosque itself should be a place for political speech. So like you said, uh, the Muslim society is continuously changing because of immigration, because of conversion, and uh, just growing. 
um, in Europe, and the, the society or the community creates the mosque, but also the mosque empowers or influences the community. Mm -hmm. So can you sort of give us a roadmap or, or tips or, or how to go about uh, bringing change into into a, into a masjid? Not just the issue of women, so there's lots of other issues. It's, it's the, the issue of tolerance, so there's a lot of intolerance towards children, mm -hmm. especially like in Ramadan, the prayers at night, there's always a tolerance for, for children. Um, so all of these issues, there's lots of issues. Yeah. It's funny though because when people say children, they usually say sisters get your children. Yeah, as if men don't have children. Yeah, it's very odd. Um, well, you know, I can't give you a road map, and I, but I really do believe that, look, the, the, the crucial issue is that you have a clear governance process and that those who are in that, that you have a, a mechanism for continually renewing your leadership and that leadership must re represent the diversity of the community, must reflect the diversity of the community. You know, in miniature, um, that it will look like the community looks. And then you're going to be able to have open discussions and make your priorities and it's gonna be different for different communities. And you may say, okay, you know, there's lots of different solutions. Maybe your community can, uh, you know, designate a certain space for, for children. Maybe you don't have those resources. Maybe you'll come up with some, something creative. Maybe for the month of Ramadan, you will um, uh, have a daycare that's just for that month so that uh, those who have children can leave the children there and pray. Maybe you come up with something else. I mean, I, you know, people also have to have to look at life cycles. Like I remember when my children were very young, and I lived across the street from the mosque. I'm going to Tarawih and standing there, and you know, really trying to to get deep into my prayer, while my kids were running back and forth, screaming and yelling. They were bothering everyone, and I certainly wasn't, you know, focusing on my prayer. So I said, you know what? I think for this year, I, I can just pray Tarawih at home. And then actually my husband and I, we, we, you know, we switched off between ourselves. Why were we bothering everyone? And, and you know, I certainly wasn't getting it and they weren't enjoying themselves. So, um, and then when they got older, I had all the time in the world to go there and it was no problem. So we kind of have to look at different life cycles and some of the solutions they have to come within the family. I mean, you know, husbands and wives, parents of children, they need to, to look at each other. Tarawih is not an obligation, you know, in Jama'ah is not an obligation for men any more than it is for women, right? It's, it's, it's not an obligation. So I think husbands and wives need to have a conversation in their home as well about how they're going to manage um, taking care of the children and also, you know, giving that kind of relief and, oppor and opportunity. But it really comes down to, you know, whatever it is, whether it is, I heard a lot today from the youth, you know, the youth feel that there's a lot of lip service to we have to care about the youth and pay attention to the youth, but they really don't have, they're not being listened to. Very few of the mosques have a youth representative on board, which surprised me. I thought, you know, I mean, we have, at, you know, a national organization like ISNA, we have our youth representatives on the national board voting for a mosque to not have a youth representative on the board really surprises me. So you need, you know, once you have the people in there, then there will be, and they're, they're given equal voice and equal vote, then these issues can be um, solved, God willing. I think we said that people could leave at 9.10, and I, I just wanna, I really respect people's time. You know, I really value the fact that people are coming and listening. So I think we should close up and then if there's, you know, I can stick around for a few minutes. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Matson, for that uh, enlightening and wisdomous words. Um, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. If we can just get another round of applause for our speaker here today. For those who stuck around, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, we all really appreciate it. And uh, please have a safe drive home. Thank you.